So this is the rule of law and liberty, why the Constitution still matters. This is part one in a series of programs that the Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs is presenting around the state of Oklahoma for the next uh, several months uh, into the middle of 2015. This program will, I think, be unlike any Constitution program you've ever been to uh, because we're going to step back and, uh, and oftentimes, you know, people dive in to the law of the Constitution, which as a lawyer, I think is very important. Um, but, uh, but we're going to step back tonight and think about the precedence to the Constitution. Think about where the Constitution came from, because I think that's very helpful to understand, and, and even more important, to make the argument about why the Constitution matters. Let me tell you about the other three programs in the series, and then we'll, we'll jump into our material for tonight. Um, in January, we will be presenting a program on why states matter, on federalism, this structure in the Constitution that actually, when you go back and look at the history, is probably the most groundbreaking thing that the American founders created. James Madison says it is a model hitherto without, uh, without example. It had never been done before. They actually had to reject a lot of conventional wisdom to create the balance between this new federal government and the states that's written into the, to the law of the Constitution. So we'll jump into that in January, which is perfectly timed because the legislature meets in February, and uh, it's a great time to talk about the importance of state legislators right before, uh, before they meet just here up the street. So we will do that program in January. A couple months after that, we will do what, what people often do when they look at the Constitution, which is look at the structures, the checks and balances, the separation of powers. Look at all these systems that were designed not just to make government complicated, but were designed really to protect our liberty, to protect our individual rights. And uh, in the last program, we will come to the other way that rights are protected in the Constitution, really, really very secondary to the structures, in my opinion. Uh, but, but finally, we will come to the Bill of Rights. And my guarantee to you, if you come to all four, but especially if you come to that, just that last program on the Bill of Rights, what I call natural rights, civil rights, and counterfeit rights, if you come to that program, you will walk away smarter than your average federal judge. Because about 100 years ago, our judiciary, for, for reasons we'll talk about tonight, got very mixed up about rights. And today, we have Supreme Court justices citing emanations from penumbras, from things in the Constitution, because they're not grounded in the ideas about rights that the American founders had. And we'll talk about that in the last class. And hopefully, it will help us to understand and even argue back against some of the bad decisions that we see handed down from federal judges in particular, and, and state judges too. Um, so that is, uh, that is our four-part series. Tonight, we're going to step back and talk about why the Constitution matters by looking at where the Constitution came from. So when we, when we think about the Constitution, but really when we think about anything, you can think about it in three different ways. And when it comes to politics, this is really important because ultimately what we do in politics is try to persuade people, which is a, a kind of education. And when we think about the Constitution, as people like us, I mean, you have sort of identified yourself as being an outlier by taking part of your evening to come and listen to a, a program on the Constitution, um, right? There's, there's not a huge line out the door, um, unfortunately. We'll, we'll get there. But, uh, but we're very interested in the details, but we're interested for a reason, and that is we already believe that they matter. And the reality about anything is that you can think about what something is, you can think about what something does, or you can think about what it means. And the only reason you ever really come to care about what something does and what it is, what it's made of, is if you start out by understanding what it means. And I'll, I'll give you my, my example here in uh, this gizmo that was handed down to me by my grandfather. Uh, <clears throat> Jim Inhofe knows what this is, but, uh, but many of you probably do not know what this is, although I see a couple heads nodding. Uh, and, and going back to my, my three-part way to think about these, this, I mean, what it is, it's aluminum and some ink, and there's a little bit of plastic in here. That's what it, what it is, and what it does, it's a flight 
calculator, a flight computer. Uh, younger people always chuckle when I call this a computer, but that's what it is. It's a computing device, very sophisticated actually. Uh, but nobody would take the time to sit down and understand it and read through the manuals that I have here unless they know what it means first, right? What this means, it's a flight computer. It means the pilot doesn't crash the airplane, right? Th this was given to my grandfather so that he could learn how to use it so that as a private pilot, he could make sure that he didn't run out of fuel in the air because of headwinds, right? That's what it means. And understanding what it means then drove him to go and study what it does, how it works, right? And the Constitution, the American founding, anything, is like that. Until we understand what it means, we're never going to care that much about what it does. And, and part of my work here at OCPA is focused on principles and persuasion and trying to wake people up to care about these things, to want to understand them. And so we have to ask the question, what does it mean? And we have to be able to make the argument, uh, come up with some explanations uh, about what it means, why we care, so we can get other people to care, so that when we hand them the pocket constitution, they actually want to know what's there, right? Rather than just seeing it as sort of like this, right? Just another rule book, right? Rules aren't that interesting uh, unless you have a reason to care. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So now we want to go way back in history. And uh, I, I love history, and, and I, I love in particular ancient history. And when it comes to the Constitution, I really believe it helps us to understand the context and the importance, the genius of the Constitution when we see it in its rightful place as uh, part of, and I think arguably the culmination of a multi-millennial argument about government. And really the ultimate questions about government are who should rule and what government should be for. And when you, you talk about the rule of law and liberty, you're trying to answer those questions. Those are the answers to those questions that the American founders gave. Who should rule? Well, oftentimes that question has been answered in terms of a person or a group of people, right? The founders thought the law should rule, right? What is government for? There are lots of ideas about that. Some people say government's not really for anything. It's just, we'll, we'll get to this later in the program, it's just a monopoly on force. It's just whoever has the, the biggest fists or the biggest guns, that's all government is. Other people have argued that government has a higher purpose, something like protecting individual rights, something like liberty. And so the rule of law and liberty are answers to these questions that have been asked since ancient times. Actually, as far back as we can go in history, we see these arguments, and, uh, and we actually see two groups of people in the ancient world who start to question the, the dominant paradigm in the ancient world and start to offer different answers to these questions about who should rule and what government is for. And the first group of people uh, that I'm going to talk about, although not the first chronologically, but we'll start with the ancient Greeks. The ancient Greeks are fascinating. They gave us drama and comedy and tragedy and, uh, and, and poetry and uh, tremendous advances in naval warfare and all of these innovative things and lots of ideas about government, lots of arguments about government. And, and I want to take you back to actually 480 BC. Uh, does anybody know what happened in 480 BC? So a few heads are nodding. What, what, what happened? The Greeks fought the Persians. That's right. And, and most people, I'll give away some, some books. You want to pass that back to him. Uh, you answer my questions, I'll, I'll give you a book. Um, the Greeks fought the Persians. And, and a lot of people know that the Persians invaded. They faced the 300 Spartans. The Spartans held out valiantly for a few days, but eventually they're overrun. And, and then oftentimes the story just gets sort of summed up, and the Persians eventually were defeated, and, and they, they went back to Persia. But actually what happens after Thermopylae is fascinating and it bears on our story. After Thermopylae, the Persians march down to Athens. Athens is this great Greek city. And, uh, and the Athenians, most of them flee. Uh, a few of their priests stay behind. And the problem that they had, that will become very clear in a moment, is that in the ancient world, 
you were an Athenian, your identity was tied up with your temple. And if you just kind of step back away from the Greeks and think about the, the, the ancient world, the ancient city in kind of generic terms, the ancient city was a place oftentimes had walls around it, had very definite barriers. In the center there's a temple. There are idols in the temple. There are priests around the, the, the temple. And your whole identity in the ancient world flowed down from there. It flowed down from the idea that your city had a particular god or particular gods. And, uh, and the priests communicated to you what they said and what they wanted you to do. And your identity and, and your idea about what was right and what was wrong was all tied to your identity as an Athenian or, or, or whatever ancient city or ancient tribe you were a part of. And so the, some of the Athenian priests stay behind because it's, it's a very bad thing. It's, it's an existential issue to have your temple destroyed, but their temple is destroyed. Their priests are killed. Their idols are carried off. The city is, is, uh, is largely burned. And the Athenians flee down to Corinth, and the Greeks have this council of war here in, in uh, 480 B.C. They get together at Corinth, and, uh, and a few other representatives of Greek cities look at the Athenians and they say this. They say, We're, we don't understand why you're here and why you are arguing with us. The Athenians had a particular idea of how to fight the Persians and not everyone agreed with that. And they said, look, your temple has been destroyed. Your idols have been carried off. Your priests have been driven away or killed. In the, natu in the ancient world way of, of thinking about things, you have become natural slaves. Your identity, your citizenship, has been destroyed by the Persians. Now, as, as often happens in, in politics, uh, the, the Athenians had a different kind of argument. That is, they had a real politic argument. They said, well, whatever, but we are the only Greeks who really have a big navy, and if you don't allow us to, uh, to stay here and remain part of the coalition and, frankly, to, uh, to get our way and how to fight the Persians, we'll just take our ships and we'll leave. We'll sail off into the west. And uh, that argument won the day. And the Persians and the, the, the Athenians were, were right, by the way. And, uh, and the Persians are eventually driven off the next year. And, uh, and Athens is rebuilt. But I don't think it's any coincidence that it is after all this happens that we begin to see a robust debate in Athens, in the rebuilt city of Athens, that maybe an Athenian's status as, as an Athenian Maybe that wasn't the most important thing, right? Maybe there are things about being human, think universal things that are actually more important than the specific things. The great record of this, there are others, but the, the one that I will hold up, the great record of this is, is in Plato's Republic, this record that Plato writes down about uh, arguments between his teacher Socrates and some other Greeks. And, uh, and there are arguments about this idea. Are there universal things that we can actually sit down and discuss and maybe even come to some agreement? Maybe we can reason about these things together. And uh, who, who knows what ultimately happens to Socrates, by the way? Killed. He's killed. He's forced to drink poison. And uh, you know, a lot of people look at that and say, well, you know, that, uh, that was an overreaction. But I submit to you, in the ancient world way of thinking, these ideas were revolutionary. They were dangerous. He was accused, Socrates was accused of corrupting the youth by turning them away from the city's gods, by arguing that there is such a thing as justice and it doesn't come from the temples in the city. It's something bigger than that. It's something universal. And part of, part of my agenda in this program is to show this argument, and, and I'm going to give you two of the arguments in this book, so that you can judge for yourself whether the arguments that we hear today are actually made by people, the, the arguments against these ideas, whether they're really made by people who are progressive, <laughs> who are more advanced than everyone else, or whether they simply sound like the same arguments recorded in this book over 2,000 years ago. Right? Socrates argues with two different people in books one and two of Plato's Republic. And it, I, I'll, I'll put in one other pitch for ancient philosophy. This is actually written so that you can read it. 
<laughs> a lot of modern philosophy is written so that people can get tenure, uh, not, not so that regular people can actually sit down and grapple with the ideas there. This is written in the form of dialogues. It kind of reads like a, a you know, very thinky novel. Um, and the first, uh, one of the first arguments here is between Socrates and Thrasymachus. Thrasymachus, this young kind of firebrand Greek, and I sort of picture him as a, maybe a football player looking guy, and he says, look, Socrates, all your stuff about justice and big universal ideas, that's all kind of hocus pocus, religious sounding stuff. He says, I, I'm, I live in the real world, and in the real world, you simply have to bend to whoever makes the rules, whoever has the most power. He says, justice is the will of the stronger. But, but then Thrasymachus steps back and makes an interesting clarification. He says, but we're civilized Greeks, right? Here in Athens, we understand that the strongest force is government. Government defines right and wrong, right? Government, uh, and this is a defense really of the ancient world, government tells us what's right and wrong and who are we to differ with them? Because ultimately they have the power to enforce their will on us. So this is Thrasymachus' argument, but sort of, uh, you know, sounds very thuggish to, uh, to even some of his defenders. And so along comes in book two, Glaucon. And, and Glaucon makes a slightly modified argument. And you're all, uh, if you haven't read this before, you're all going to, uh, uh, to suddenly realize J.R.R. Tolkien is, is uh, a, a genius, but not quite as creative as you thought he was. Because Glaucon says, what if there was a magic ring? What if there was a magic ring and you could put it on your finger and become invisible? And uh, people who read this for the first time, it really is sort of striking um, if you're a Tolkien fan like I am. Uh, Glaucon says, look, if, if, you, if you had this magic ring and you put it on your finger, you could do whatever you want. There would be no consequences. And long story short, he constructs the argument that, that justice is simply a cultural paradigm. It's simply what everybody thinks it is. We want good reputations. And so we do what we call justice, but it has, it's, it's not a universal thing. This is an argument that sounds very much like multiculturalism, right? It's a cultural paradigm. It's different for different people, and we just sort of go along to get along, and that's justice. Now, in, in a program of, of the, the time we have here today, um, I, I can't go through everything that Socrates uh, says in response, but, uh, but needless to say, he doesn't give in. And he argues that we can actually understand concepts like justice. And, and part of the argument, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll step back and give you an argument that sounds a lot more basic, but it's actually important. Part of the argument, pull out my, my little... Uh, strange uh, visual aid here. Uh, part of the argument is that when you think about physical things, you think about a chair, for example. There are two kinds of chairs in this room, and then I have, I have this, which I think you would identify not as a chair, but as a model of a chair, which will become more interesting in a minute. There are, there are two kinds of chairs in this room, and they look very different. And actually, computer scientists at Google are struggling with creating computers that can recognize chairs. Uh, they, they should go back and read some Plato because he struggles with these kinds of questions as well. Uh, the interesting reality about a chair and anything that we use a common noun to describe is, is that the physical substance of any particular chair doesn't define the chair. And actually, if you look at the two chairs in this room, they're very different. The, the, the shape of it, uh, you know, there are some, there's some commonality, right? But when you think about it, there is a chairness to the chair that is separate from any physical object, right? The reason we can look at this and say this is a model of a chair, it's, it's not really a chair uh, because we couldn't sit in it. We understand the function of a chair, but we also recognize that this is designed to represent something that has that same function. And, uh, and, and Socrates actually says it's, this is a good place to start. We have to understand that even when we think about things that we think are absolutely tangible and concrete, we actually think about them in idealized terms, or we think about an idea of a chair or a table or a tree or a human being or justice, right, in, in, in a way that is removed from the physical world. We apply those labels or forms to the physical world so that we can talk about them, so that we can think about them, 
But this is sort of his, his argument that we can, as human beings, reason. And actually, those scientists at Google, one of the things they realized is that if you want your computer to recognize a chair, better than just showing it lots of pictures of chairs and, and helping it to visually understand what chairs might look like, if you can teach your computer what a chair is for, what the purpose of a thing is, I, it is a fascinating paper with all kinds of calculations and things in it that, uh, that are a little bit beyond me. But the, the, the basic point of this paper, it came out last year, was that if you understand the purpose of a thing, right, the form of a thing, you can actually recognize it much better. And, uh, you know, the, the scientists at Google should have just read this, uh, but, but they've eventually, they're getting there. Uh, so so this, is the, this is the argument, um, again, in, in ancient Athens about these ideas. And they lead to radical different, uh, uh, different understandings about government and the standards to which you can hold government. Socrates trains Plato, Plato trains Aristotle. Aristotle um, is a thinker of just amazing range, natural sciences, uh, what we today would call uh, politics and, and government, um, and uh, thinks a lot about the, the city and uh, the, the nature of human beings. He, uh, his famous quote, uh, man is a political animal, it's sort of better, better translated, man is a social animal. But based on this idea that we, we can reason, and we like to reason, and part of the great thing about human beings getting together in a city is that we can do just that. And we can be very different. It's actually glimmerings, I think, of Adam Smith in some of Aristotle. We can actually be very different and come together in a way that allows us to be even more different, to do the things that, uh, that, that we want to do, um, and, and to do them even better together um, if we can reason together about some of these things. So I told you that we were going to talk about two groups of people in the ancient world who sort of revolted against this ancient idea, the ancient city, and began this argument. So we've talked about the Greeks. Now I want to talk about the other group of people. So, <clears throat> so the other group of people in the ancient world who began to argue with the ancient city, to argue with that, this idea that, uh, that what matters most is our identity as members of some particular tribe or group, were the Israelites. Uh, the Israelites who had this nasty habit of marching around in the desert, letting people know, look, you have your gods and we have our god, but we think our god is actually real, <laughs> and created the whole universe, and has set down some rules that we think actually, in ways that I think ancient Israel didn't completely understand, we think actually have some general applicability to people, whether you are part of our tribe or not. And, uh, I mean, try, try doing this on a major university campus today, right? <laughs> it's not a very popular thing to say to people who think that, you know, we should just live and let live and, and uh, you know, every, everything is up for grabs, to say, no, we actually think we understand some ultimate things that apply to you uh, the same way they apply to us, whether you agree with that or not, right? Not a popular thing to, uh, to do on campus, not a popular thing to do in the ancient world. Uh, and this actually, this understanding is built into the original way that ancient Israel is governed, which actually shows us some things about government today and especially about, well, what, what was the title of the leaders in ancient Israel before they had kings? What were their leaders called? Judges. Israel had judges. And it struck me once in looking at this that it's not entirely obvious what the difference is. Right? It, it, it's kind of implied in, in the book of 1 Samuel, but it's not, it's not stated outright why it matters because Gideon did not wear a black robe and carry a gavel. Right? The judges in ancient Israel were not recognizably, in any superficial way at least, different from the leader of any other tribe around them, I, I don't think. Uh, so what, what difference does it make? Well, what's the difference between judges and kings? I mean, this becomes a, uh, a really crucial point, and the Israelites are warned, if, if you insist on having a king, it's going to change your whole society. It's going to change your whole structure of government. But again, it, it's, not, it's not explicitly stated why that has to be the case. But the claim to be a judge, the use of the title judge, up until about a hundred years ago, actually, meant something very, very specific. 
The claim to be a judge was a claim to be under authority. Right? You think about it, a common law judge was bound by the common law. Right? And, and, a, and a judge, even in a, in a Napoleonic law system, a statute law system, was bound absolutely by the statutes of the legislature. A judge in ancient, ancient Israel was bound by the laws that God had given ancient Israel. And that was, that was the, the claim. That was the understanding. It's sort of like being an interpreter. Right? Now, interpreters don't always get it right. Interpreters may have biases. But it's a totally different thing to be an interpreter to be under authority and to be a king, to claim to be the authority, right? And, and this is, if you go back and you read it and you think about that, you think about that difference, it becomes very clear why this matters and why, uh, and why judges in ancient Israel, why that was the original system, because they believed that they had this law and they wanted what? They wanted the rule of law. In that case, the laws that God had given them, but it was a system of the rule of law with, with judges rather than with kings. And, and the warnings about kings, not to belabor the point, but if you go back and you, and you read that transition, the warnings about kings uh, make it very clear that the concern was that eventually they would not follow the law because the claim of kingship was to be able to make the law yourself, to be the authority. So that's ancient Israel. We talked about the ancient Greeks. All of this actually flows together toward a confluence that then flows up to us and to the American founding. And I, I want to trace that for us. First, though, we have to bounce back over to uh, not Greece, but a little bit further in the Mediterranean, over to Rome. Rome becomes the inheritors of that ancient Greek philosophy. And you can actually trace it down from Aristotle into Rome. The Romans had this this strange trait, actually, as militaristic as they were, they have this odd streak of humility. Not in all of them. <laughs> but, uh, but some of them, they were very interested in Greek philosophy. They brought a lot of those ideas into the Roman Empire very purposefully. They thought the Greeks were, were brilliant. They kind of thought they were, uh, you know, they, they weren't great uh, fighters, but they thought they were brilliant. And, uh, and this streak of humility affects Greek philosophy in, in an interesting way. So what you see in Rome, and, and this comes toward the end of the Roman Republic, and then you see uh, glimmers of this during the empire, is a focus on an idea that becomes really, really important in the Enlightenment and in the American founding. And that is the role of human nature. And, and the Romans, some of the Romans, became very concerned that, look, all of these they said the, the Greeks, these thinkers, these ideas that flowed down from Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, those ideas are all, are all great and true. But the problem is that our human nature, you're asking us to sit down and reason about these things, our human nature is so flawed that not only do we deceive others, but much, much worse, we deceive ourselves. And, uh, and this leads to some of the Roman philosophers and statesmen having a, uh, a somewhat retiring view even, uh, being very concerned about public life in general, and, uh, um, and, and even some ideas about limited government um, in, 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 a certain, uh, in a certain way, because they recognize we have this problem of human nature, and dealing with it is, is becomes sort of the crux of the problem of government. Now, if, if you think about it, uh, to, to me at least, this sort of tease up the Roman Empire for Christianity because you have these people, the, the Greeks said we look at the world around us and we see a certain order and we look within us with our reason and we see a certain order and yet we don't understand why it's there. And the Romans say, yeah we can do all that but we are so flawed that we're worried that as we do it we're going to make mistakes and they're going to be harmful to others or to ourselves. And then you see the, from, from ancient Israel down through Christianity, people come along and say, yes, we look at the world around us and we see an order. And we think we know why, right? We think we understand why that is there. And, and that we can also uh, uh, understand it in, uh, uh, in perhaps an even better way. Think about in Paul's writings, this idea of seeing through a glass darkly or having the law written on the heart, right? These corresponded very closely with, with sort of what the Greeks said, and then obviously uh, 
um, Paul and others are able to, uh, to step in and say, we think we have the answers to some of your questions. And the reasoning, the arguing continues. Um, Augustine, uh, just to, to move now very quickly toward the, the Enlightenment, um, Augustine looks at, uh, he, he often identified as a theologian, but he thinks about government as well, and he looks at government. And he says, this just fascinates me, he, he says, you know, some people identify government as just a monopoly on force. And I mentioned that at the beginning of the program. You hear that definition. Augustine points out that if, if that's all government is, there is no difference between a prince and a pirate. Right? There's no difference between government and organized crime. And organized crime says within our territory, we are a monopoly on force. Right? If that's all government is, it's just, a, it's just the biggest, most organized form of criminal activity. Right? Augustine says, look, the only way government is different, and ultimately the only way government is legitimate, is if we have an understanding of standards to which government can be held. Right? And ultimately, if we have a system where we are able to hold government accountable to those standards, this is a really powerful insight. And again, I, I, I have, for a long time, I had heard this explanation, well, government's just a monopoly on force, and just sort of accepted that. But it is problematic. And 2,000 years ago, almost, uh, we, had, uh, we had the thinker where all these ideas come together pointing this out for us. So the next thinker we want to talk about is my favorite. I'll, I'll admit that to you. My favorite thinker, and, uh, and, and we're skipping now from Augustine up uh, about, uh, about 800 years to Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas lives at a fascinating moment in Western history. Does anybody know why? I see a few heads nodding. Um, I, I've, been, I've been really excited doing these programs that I've run into some Aquinas fans. But, uh, but there were some writings rediscovered in the generation immediately preceding Thomas Aquinas. You, you, you're, you're nodding your head. You, no, Aristotle. Aristotle is, is the big one. That's, that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, I've got to, uh, I'll, I'll give you another book because you're, <laughs> you're answering these. <laughs> so Aristotle has been lost for, uh, for al almost a, a millennium. I mean, it's been lost certainly to the West since the fall of the Roman Empire and, um, uh, and is recovered actually through Islamic scholars. Islamic scholars had maintained a lot of these manuscripts. And so Thomas Aquinas gets all of this, um, but he also gets all of the Islamic uh, interpretations written about Aristotle and some of these other Greek thinkers. And he, he goes through a process of, of looking at Aristotle, looking at these interpretations, taking his own Christian faith, and trying to understand all of this. And one of his famous works is called the Summa Contra Gentiles, which is the summation against the Gentiles. But what it really was was an argument against the Islamic scholars about what Aristotle really meant, uh, and, and particularly from, from his Christian view. Now, if you want to know something about the Christianity of Thomas Aquinas, I will tell you one anecdote from his early life. And uh, you can read, there's a great biography by G.K. Chesterton of, of Thomas Aquinas uh, called the, the Dumb Ox, which was what people called him as a young man because he was, he was very sedate. It turned out he was very thoughtful, but he was very quiet. And he decided he wanted to join the church, which would have involved, did involve taking a vow of poverty. He came from a wealthy family. And his family thought this was a horrible idea. They actually kidnapped him when he was trying to go off, join the church, brought him back, locked him in a room in the family estate, and sent a, a, a young woman from the town in to argue with him uh, and convince him not to, to, uh, to become a, a Dominican. And uh, he realizes what's going on, and uh, he, he goes to the fire. He picks up a glowing hot poker, chases this poor young woman from the room, and carves a red hot cross on the wooden door and his family relents. <laughs> and he joins the church, and, and he becomes this amazing scholar, uh, writes volumes and volumes of writing. And I, I told you about this and the fact that it's accessible. I think it's written to be accessible. Thomas Aquinas is hard to read because he, he tackles these huge issues, and he's very methodical, and so it takes a long time. But 
it is written in a way that you can actually dig into because of the way it's organized. He actually writes, this is my, uh, this is a very, uh, a very boiled down or, or excerpted version of Thomas Aquinas, but he, he writes in the form of, of questions, and uh, it's maybe a little bit hard to see here, but it's all broken down. It's, it's sort of like an outline where he writes a question and then he offers evidence, quotations from Aristotle or from the Bible or from other thinkers or statesmen, and then he tries to bring all that together and, uh, and make sense of it very much like a common law judge might do, citing all this precedent and trying to understand. And that's because this really is, in, in a certain sense, the, the origin of the idea or one, one origin of the idea of common law. Because Thomas Aquinas formulates what becomes called the natural law. And based on those ideas that the, that the Greeks had, that, the, that ancient Israel had, he said, we, we look at the world around us and we see an order. If we're really serious about it, if we really engage what, what is called, what's translated right reason, if we're, if we're really reasonable about it, we can see an order in the world around us. We can see an order in the way human beings interact, in the way we think. If we're serious, thoughtful about ourselves, we can recognize all sorts of things. You know, the, the, the Roman uh, recognition that we are, we are often self-deceptive and self-serving, right? We can see that and understand that. We can also see people doing things that everyone agrees are, are self-sacrificial and, uh, and, and valiant, right? And, and why is that? Why do we see this, not just an order in the natural world, but an order in the moral world? And uh, I've told you about the scholars at, at Google. There are scholars at MIT, one in particular, who, uh, who has recognized this uh, through his own research. He says there are a lot of things that, that actually seem to be universal across cultures all around the world and, and all throughout time, as, as much as we can tell. C.S. Lewis wrote a book um, about, uh, I don't know, about uh, 80 years ago or so um, called The Abolition of Man, where he, he also talks about, it's kind of a, it's almost a prequel to mere Christianity. And the Abolition of Man talks about this as well. He said there are certain things that everyone seems to understand, right? And Thomas Aquinas builds this whole, uh, this whole way of thinking uh, based on this idea that there's an order in the world and we can think about it and try to come to some understandings of truth. And it's, that's basically uh, the foundation of things like the common law. Common law judges weren't just bound by precedent. The precedent was supposed to help them not make the law, but the language always was discover the law, right? The common law judges talked about discovering the law. The principles were already there, but the situations come along and the judge takes that situation, goes mostly to precedent, right, but also to common sense, and tries to understand what are the true principles that I can discover to apply to this particular conflict between a couple of neighboring farmers or the railroad and the landowner or whatever the common law case is. So Thomas Aquinas is very important. I'll give you one more of his insights and then we'll move to the, uh, the Enlightenment. Thomas Aquinas writes, this will sound I think like Jefferson, he writes, when you look at this order, when you look at mankind, you see that humans are equal in their liberty though not in any other respect. Right? Sound like Jefferson, right? When, when, you, when you take this natural law understanding and try to understand something about human beings, there's a certain human dignity that we have, a certain way in which we are all equal, even though in every other way we are all different, we may all be very, very different, right? But there's something there at the core that is the same. So now we come to the Enlightenment, and this is where people oftentimes start uh, when they think about the American founding and all these ideas, but it's so important to go back before this. Uh, because when you dive right into the Enlightenment, it's easy to see it as this really, really divergent period of time where you have people coming to what seem like opposite conclusions. But one of the important things about this period of time is, I, I think, that most of these thinkers actually agreed on some core things and disagreed on something else that, that drives them to very different conclusions. But if you look at what a lot of the Enlightenment thinkers say, they all seem to recognize that, uh, that, that there should be something like the rule of law, that liberty is a good thing. And where I think they differ is this. It's that pesky question of human nature. 
Right, this question that the Romans focused on and sort of brought up, Christianity addresses a lot, right? What is our nature and, and what does our nature leave us in need of? But uh, I'll give you the bookends on the Enlightenment to help show how I think this is true. On, on one end, we have Thomas Hobbes. And Thomas Hobbes wrote Leviathan. And a lot of people see Thomas Hobbes as just this heavy-handed guy. But why does he think we need Leviathan. I just, they, they all wrote in terms of a state of nature. That was how they thought, that the great thinkers, how they, they philosophized about what human nature was like. You take everything away, you sort of drop someone on the proverbial desert island, what do they do? And, and that would expose their, their human nature. And actually, um, if, if, you were, if you were not a philosopher, you would have thought about those questions in terms probably of this book if you lived around the time of the American founding. Robinson Crusoe is a book about life in a state of nature. It's a book about human nature, um, but for people who weren't reading uh, Plato or Thomas Hobbes or John Locke. Um, and so actually this, if you want to go back and, and experience how a lot of early Americans would have thought about these same questions, this is the book to, uh, to, to do that. Uh, but Thomas Hobbes says, Life in a state of nature would be, anybody know the quote? It's a famous quote, nasty, brutish, and short. And actually, there are, there are a bunch more uh, des descriptors in that statement. Uh, it would be horrible. His view of human nature is not just dour, it's dire. Right? And I don't know if he had a bad dating experience as a young man <laughs> or, or what. But what he says is, if you want something like the rule of law and liberty, well, human nature is so bad, you have to have a big, powerful government. It's almost like you have to have tyranny and then keep your fingers crossed that the tyrant in charge will, respect your, will choose to respect your rights, which actually wasn't such an outlier idea back when there were some good kings. Right? The founders recognized that. There were some, some kings or some periods of time in kingdoms where the king was very benevolent, where the king had a view that he should respect the rights of the people. Right? Thomas Hobbes says, you need that uh, because of his view of human nature. Now you go to the other side. The other, so that's one bookend on the Enlightenment. Go to the other side. You go to, to Rousseau. <laughs> and, uh, and Rousseau says life in a state of nature would be a return to Eden. Right? Life in a state. We are wonderful. Um, I, don't, I, think, I think Rousseau just spent a lot of time by himself. <laughs> but but uh, his view of human nature was essentially angelic. And, uh, and so he says, look, the problem is government and all of the other structures in society. If you see a problem, it's because of some created artificial structure. It might be government. It might be the family. It might be the church. Right? All of these structures to Rousseau, they're the problem. Human nature and setting it free are the answer. So these are the bookends. And if you think about it again, that there is an agreement and then there is a disagreement. Right? There is an agreement in a, in a certain sense about what, what we want, but the views on human nature drive, uh, drive the, the, the practical outcomes to opposite ends of the spectrum. I think completely opposite ends of the spectrum pretty much in the case of, of Hobbes and, and Rousseau. And then in the middle, you have thinkers like John Locke, uh, who become very influential on the American founders. You have, you have people who recognize uh, that, that part of what Thomas Hobbes says is true, but also have, have the same aspirations that Alexander Hamilton writes about at the beginning of the Federalist Papers, where he says, look, the, the great test is, can, uh, can we rise above what they would call our passions? Can our reason govern our passions? Can we actually sit down and create a government based on what's good about our human nature that then allows us to control what's bad about our human nature? So this question of human nature really is at the core I think, of understanding not just the American founding, but why the American founding was absolutely remarkable. But let's, uh, let's go into our reading packet and look at some of the references in the Federalist Papers to human nature. And if you go to Federalist 10, if you flip over to page 23, 
James Madison, this is a famous, uh, there are 85 essays in The Federalist, and this is one of the most famous in, uh, in our modern era. Actually wasn't, wasn't as famous uh, for about the first hundred years, and I think maybe that's because everybody had basically the same understanding of human nature, and so this wasn't as interesting to people then. But in the, literally right, right at the beginning of the progressive era, this becomes much more interesting and, uh, and suddenly appears in all the excerpts of The Federalist that are, that are reprinted. Um, Madison is writing about faction. He's basically writing about people who want to use government to do something that will abuse the rights of others, harm other people, not just special interests. Madison makes an explicit moral judgment. These are people who would use government to do something that is unjust. And, uh, and he talks about ways that you might deal with this problem of faction. And he says, if you follow me to line 65 on page 23, he says, the problem is the latent causes of faction are sown in the nature of man. And he says this because some politicians claim, and he, he points this out, some politicians claim, well, we will solve the problem of faction. We'll solve the problem of uh, people trying to, to use government by improving human beings. Right? We'll just find people who are so good in government, um, or we'll give people enough education that they'll rise above all this. And Madison says, look, he says, there are only two ways to solve the problem at that level, and that is to deprive people of their freedom. Right? You deprive people of their freedom, then you won't have problems with these pesky factions. Or you, know, you might think about people today who want to rewrite the First Amendment uh, to make it harder to be involved in politics. Right? You can deprive people of their freedom and solve part of this problem of faction, or you can try to force everyone to have the same opinions. Madison says those are the only two ways you can go after this problem that is latent in the nature of man at its source. Right? And some of you might be thinking, common core. Right? I mean, there are all these attempts by government. I once had a professor who said people should not be allowed to homeschool or to go to private school or anything other than government schools because we need to force everyone to have basically the same opinions. We need to control what they think so that we can rise above this pesky problem of faction in his op opinion. Um, Madison says, look, that, that doesn't work, or at least that's not what we're all about in the United States of America. That violates our most basic principles and goes on to talk about what we'll talk about in part two and part three of this series which is how do you then structure government so that accepting that human nature is a problem, you try to ameliorate that problem as best you can. And he returns to that theme in Federalist 51, which you will find on uh, page, where are we, page uh, 40, uh, 37, excuse me. So on page 37, this is James Madison writing again um, another one of the most famous Federalist papers. This is probably the most famous quote uh, that we will come to here in a moment. Uh, but uh, Madison says, starting on line 72, page 37, talking about these checks and balances, these structures that we'll talk about in future programs, he says, it may be a reflection on human nature that such devices should be necessary to control the abuses of government but what is government itself? Then the, but the greatest of all reflections on human nature. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. That's what Rousseau said, right? If, angels, if men were angels, we wouldn't even need government. On the other hand, if angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. We'll come to this idea of whether you can find angels to govern men when we talk about the Declaration of Independence, and we talk about its, its primary critics, the progressives. Uh, if men were angels, no, uh, if angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary in framing a government which is to be administered by men over men. The great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. The real genius of the American founders, I mean, what, what really sets them apart, there are other people who have understood this point, right, or who have at least paid lip service to the idea that the, we create government because human nature is flawed. But government is a bunch of people who we elect to have power over us. 
who have the same flawed human nature that was the reason we created government in the first place, right? This is a fundamental problem. It seems very circular, right, the, the logic behind all this. And the problem of founding has always been that the founders always know who will hold power first, right? If you're a founder, you are, you are most likely to be among the people who will hold that power in the institutions that you are creating yourself, right? And, uh, and so when we go on, when we study federalism, which is kind of the ultimate check on, on power, the, the ultimate separation of powers, and then when we study the structures, the other structures in the Constitution, the framers of the Constitution tied their own hands. Right? They followed through on what they said about human nature. Right? They actually applied all that to government to try to tie their own hands. They knew that they would, hold gover uh, that they would be the, the first generation to hold that power, and they were. And, and frankly, they were right to be skeptical because you look at the election of 1800, right? And, it's, uh, and even before that, 1796, I mean, the vitriol and the, the sudden disagreements that seemed to, to just rise up out of thin air <laughs> then again, Madison in, in, uh, in The Federalist also says, where there are no reasons for people to fight with each other, they'll just come up with something. It always works that way. Right? They tied their own hands. The best, uh, the best expression of that, Benjamin West, uh, an American painter, then actually, uh, actually painting at the court of King George after hostilities had ended in the American Revolution. And uh, King George is sort of hectoring him. You know, he's... Uh, as, as a person who happens to be American there at the court, he's sort of the ad hoc representative. And, uh, and King George says, well, what do you think George Washington will do when the peace treaty is finally signed and the war is officially over? And Benjamin West says, I, I think he'll go home to Mount Vernon, become a farmer again. And King George sneers and says, if he does that, he will be the greatest man in the world. Right? There's prophecy for you, right? But, but, but King George understood that that is, is the ultimate problem of founding, right? Is that you have to be willing to tie your own hands. And the American founders in the Constitution, I believe, really did that. They really, uh, they really applied their beliefs in creating the Constitution to, to govern even themselves. <clears throat> Okay, let's, let's look at the Declaration of Independence because unlike any other country I know of, our country has an explicit mission statement. I, and, and think about how remarkable this is. You turn there, it's the first thing in the reading packet. George, uh, Abraham Lincoln started the Gettysburg Address four score and seven years ago. Our, na our, uh, our forefathers brought forth upon this continent, a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. And we just all accept that. He's saying July 4th, 1776 was when our nation was created. And it was created based on those ideas. Right? But that, if you go any other place in the world and you ask them when their nation began, right? when they started a revolution, when they ended a revolution, right? we could have said April 19th, 1775, or 1781 when the British surrendered at Yorktown, or 1783 when the peace treaty was signed, all of those dates would make perfect sense. Or you could go up to maybe 1787 or 1789 when the Constitution is, is, uh, is completed and then is, is finally ratified and goes into effect. Those dates would make sense. John Adams was close. Does anyone know when John Adams thought our, our nation's birthday would be celebrated? He comes the closest. You may have read his letter on the 4th of July, but he wasn't writing about the 4th of July when he said this day will be celebrated with bonfires and illuminations. He was writing as a good attorney about July 2nd because July 2nd, 1776 is when we legally resolved our independence. So John Adams says in his lawyerly way, that's our independence day, right? But we celebrate July 4th, 1776, and all that happened on that day was that we explained ourselves. I think about that. All that. Our nation's birthday is based on just an explanation. And let's look at that explanation and, uh, and, and just see how it connects to this debate that we've been talking about so far. When in the course of human events, 
it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. There are three words in there about duty, uh, necessity, uh, they're impelled, they're required, right? Uh, they are people who have a duty to some higher set of principles. That, that's clear in, in just that, uh, that, that simple language that often gets glossed over. And, and the laws of nature and nature's God, such a perfect way to say what the Greeks said, we look at nature and we see laws, right? We see gravity, but we also see all of these things about human beings that are consistent over time and across different places, right? We see laws of nature and, moving over to ancient Israel, right? We believe we know why that is there. We think we have an explanation for why there is order. The laws of nature make sense because we believe that nature has a God, right? And so they bring together those two explanations in that phrase, and then we have a decent respect to the opinions of mankind. You're sort of back with the Greeks there, right? We believe that we can reason one with another. We believe we can understand some things about ideas. And, and we think it's our duty, like Socrates apparently thought it was his duty, to, to at least try to convince you. And then it's up to you. And, and here's what we believe. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Now, this, this phrase catches people all the time, and it has almost since the beginning. I mean, at least, uh, at least by the 1850s, people were saying, come on, self-evident truths. What if I disagree? Does that make it suddenly not self-evident? But that's, that's not what it means. And actually, if, uh, if you flip over with me uh, to Federalist 31, this one is not red. <laughs> this is not one of the popular Federalist papers. Page 27. Self-evident at the time of the founding, people would have understood uh, this is almost throwaway language from Alexander Hamilton, just sort of reiterating the point that people would understand before he makes his argument. This is what he says. In disquisitions of every kind, there are certain primary truths or first principles upon which all subsequent reasonings must depend. These contain an internal evidence which antecedent to all reflection or combination commands the assent of the mind. Uh, you can flip back to the declaration there. He goes on to say, now people can work really hard and they can disagree with these things, but the point about self-evident is you have to start somewhere. And, and if you think about this, you really do. <laughs> when you reason, when you talk, when we communicate, you have to start somewhere, right? You have to start at some level of agreement before you move on to other things, the idea of a self-evident truth is that there are certain things that you can look at and just understand without bringing in outside evidence. Your, your argument about, about a certain thing can be self-evident. You can hold up the thing and say, there are certain truths that I think we can just all agree on, and therefore we can then reason beyond that. Right? And we can't reason beyond that unless there is a certain foundation that we can stand on together. That's the idea. And people can disagree, and, and Hamilton, if you, if you go back to that later on your own time, Hamilton has sort of a description uh, for, you know, for people uh, um, you know, doing, doing crazy and absurd things uh, to, uh, to try to disagree with truths that ought to be self-evident. Uh, but that's the argument. Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Here are those truths. That all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. And we will leave it right there. Happiness comes up twice. And again, this is a point that some people today say, well, so government is about making me happy. Well, that's, that's great. Let me, let me give you the list of things I need, <laughs> right? Um, happiness is this rich concept that, again, comes, uh, most people would, would trace it back to, uh, to roots among Greek philosophers talking about 
what it takes to live a fulfilled life. And the most common definition would be something like this. You need to have some knowledge about virtue, and you need to have a certain, a certain basic level of, of an ability to carry that out. Uh, so you need to know something about what it means to live a good life, and then you need to have the ability to, uh, to at least pursue that. And again, modern thinkers <laughs> or modern social scientists uh, have confirmed that this seems to be the case. If you look at studies on happiness, right, if you, are, uh, if you are living below the subsistence level, it's very hard to be happy, right? If you are constantly worried about, about survival, it's hard to be happy. Once you reach that level, once you reach the level where you're not, you're, you're not constantly worried about your own survival, then happiness becomes, uh, becomes a lot less dependent on your level of material well-being and starts to have a lot more to do with the things that you're able to do with your life. Right? And, uh, and, and social scientists have, have basically said this, you know, roughly confirming, I think, what the Greeks said and what the American founders had in mind. Right? Happiness was about creating a society where you can live a good life. So <clears throat> one, one other phrase, well, two other things to call out here. Um, I, I love the humility right towards the end of the section that we read. Uh, we are going to, uh, to organize its powers in such form as, as shall seem most likely to affect our safety and happiness. Um, there's an acknowledgement that the, they say the principles are true, and oftentimes people focus on the Declaration as you know, almost dogmatic. These are self-evident, they're true, we're going to give you a list of what they are, but of course when it comes to actually forming a government, there's a recognition right there in the Declaration that that part is hard. And that part is, there are a lot of opinions about how to do it. And we see this again when we come to the actual framing of the Constitution. A lot of disagreement about how you achieve the goals that everyone basically agreed on. How do you get there? And uh, we, we see right in the Declaration an acknowledgement that that part isn't clear. And there probably are different ways to do that. Uh, maybe dependent, again, on, on exactly where your, your view of human nature is, and maybe just dependent on your reading of human history. Uh, but again, we'll, we'll talk more about those things in, in Class 2 on federalism and Class 3 on checks and balances. How did all this come together? And uh, why did they structure things the way that they did? Finally, let me give you the, the two glosses I have on this whole idea of human equality. And I referenced Thomas Aquinas and his statement about man being equal in his liberty, though not in other respects, and, uh, and the whole idea that there is some concept of justice uh, and that it's accessible to people. The Greeks argued about was it accessible to everybody or only to a few, um, but, there, but there were some who thought this is accessible to everybody. There's a certain uh, human dignity. I think the Declaration puts it best, and Jefferson later in his life was, was asked, well, can you... Can you boil this down even more? Here's what, I'll give you his gloss, and then I'll give you mine. And then we'll move on to the critics, the people who disagree with the Declaration of Independence. But uh, Jefferson said, look, it's as simple as this. He said this in a letter late in his life. He said, you can look at a man and a horse, and you can instantly tell. It's self-evident. One is meant to ride on the other and not the other way around. No, nobody, nobody has any question about that. It doesn't come up, right? It's a self-evident truth. The, the way Jefferson puts it, uh, to, 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 to not paraphrase but give you the quote, he says, The great mass of man were not born with saddles on their backs, nor a, a chosen few born booted and spurred to ride them by the grace of God. Right? Lincoln would later kind of echo this point. But you can make an argument that, you know, one person among us is meant to rule all of us, or that a certain class of people is meant to rule all of us. Or You can make the argument, but it's not obvious. It's not self-evident. And actually, when you really reason it out correctly, uh, it, it, it is clear that while people can make all sorts of self-serving arguments, um, that there is something, there is some level where Thomas Aquinas is right, right, where we are all equal. I'll, I'll give you my, my gloss on this. And uh, you, can, you can decide whether you like Jefferson's better or, or mine. But um, these are pennies. Uh, my, my youngest daughter gave these to me uh, because I kept asking for people in the audience to fish pennies out of their pockets for me. So she, she just said, why don't you just carry your own? Um, <clears throat> and uh, I think she was embarrassed that her dad was panhandling uh, in the middle of a program. But uh, 
But these are, these are pennies. I think one is 2004 and one is 2006. And uh, so you can tell them apart right away. Um, and they're, you know, they're a little different color, um, just a little different amounts of oxidization on there. Um, I, I actually, a few weeks ago uh, at a drive-thru, uh, you know, put my hand out for the change and I had a penny dropped into my hand that was so disgusting. I, I was just desperate to get home and wash my hand, right? So a lot of pennies we could tell apart very easily. But of course, we could go to a mint. We could put our hand out and let two pennies roll off the mint, one after the other, into our hand. And they would be indistinguishable to our naked eye. But still, we could take them down to probably OU. And we could find a, a, a good, serious material scientist there who could put those things under an electron microscope and come up with an explanation for all of the ways in which they are clearly different. Even things as, that are identical to the naked eye can always be broken down, if you have enough scientific instruments, to show how they're materially different. But none of the things that make these materially different, whether they're obvious or whether they are only obvious to a scientist with advanced technology, none of those things has anything to do with the reason why we carry these around. Right? We carry these around for one reason. And th th that is the one way in which they are all equal. Right? These have a value totally separate from their material condition. Right? They have a value, in a way in which they are equal. Right? No matter how different or how similar they, they appear to us to be. Right? The, the value of these is, is uh, is the same. They are equal, and it's because, I might add, they're created equal. We actually know these were created for a purpose. Their creator stamped an image upon them, which helps us to understand that. And, and according to that purpose for which they are created, they are all equal, though materially they're all different. Right? And that is what the Declaration of Independence, I think, means to say. So we, we talked about the ideas leading up to the American founding. We, we've talked about what the founders thought about human nature and looked at the Declaration of Independence. But there's always another side. What we saw right at the beginning, it's always an argument. Some people want to answer the question, who should rule, with the rule of law. Some people want to answer the question, what government is for, with ideas like justice, like liberty. And other people have different views and have different views about how government should be constructed. And uh, I, I gave you uh, at least one sample in there of, of 19th century disagreement over the Declaration of Independence principles. But I want to jump right to the early 20th century to the American progressives because that's really the mess we're in today. <laughs> if, if you, if you uh, uh, at least if you agree with my side of the argument. Those are the people who are arrayed against the, the founding principles today. They come out of uh, the early American progressives, people like um, John Dewey, very influential in, in education, but he was a philosopher, wrote widely on a lot of topics, and had tremendous influence. People like Woodrow Wilson, and uh, just a moment we will be on page 54 of the reading packet. We'll talk about Wilson. But let's go back and find out where all of this came from. So at the time of the American founding, the idea of divine right of kings was really discredited. I mean, Thomas Paine uh, was, was not writing something that most people hadn't already heard. He was just writing it a lot better um, with a lot of punch. And uh, you know, when, when, he was, when he was criticizing this idea uh, that, uh, that, that God has chosen some person or some small group of people to control everybody else, that idea was going away, and so I think it's, it's unsurprising that another idea would come along to take its place, another alternative to the idea of government by consent and uh, the ideas in the Declaration of Independence. They're unsettling to some people, right? Politics is a messy business. If you're just going to let people uh, sort of, you know, give them a set of rules and then let people go out and disagree, right, that, that, that's problematic. And so th this other view comes out of the German university, primarily. At least that's where, that's where I trace it, and I think it's the right place to go. There's a philosopher named Hegel in the German university in the early 19th century who, who says, he says, look, he, he says, 
man in the past woke up and read the Bible because he thought that by going back into history, he could determine what was true. Hegel said, no longer. He said, man in the future will wake up and read the news because what matters is not the past but the future. And the closest we can get to the future is right now. And so what we need to be focused on is not what happened in the past, but just on what's happening right now and how we can propel ourselves ever faster into the future. Hegel's view is sometimes called Hegelian historicism with a big capital H. History becomes the most important thing. And I, I will give you, uh, I'll just give you a couple of, uh, uh, of, of quotes from, from Hegel. This is a great this is a great resource if you're looking for resources that uh, kind of describe some of these different political thinkers uh, by, by Leo Strauss and Joseph Cropsey. Uh, Leo Strauss is sort of the professor of my professors and, and some of their professors. Um, and, and so I, uh, I appreciate his, uh, his explication of some of these thinkers. Um, but uh, the explanation here of, uh, of Hegel uh, he, he looks for that force in society that can, that can pull us into the future, that can help us to realize this potential that has gone unrealized, but that, that it is our mission to achieve. And so that, of course, is the state. Just like Thrasymachus arguing with Socrates, right? The most powerful force is supposed to be the state. And so, uh, summarizing some of Hegel, it, it is only in and by the state that the individual gains his true reality, for only in and by the state uh, does he come into universality. Um, it is in devotion to the state that the individual goes beyond his primitive, spontaneous selfishness. And uh, it's just a, a taste of this idea that, uh, that, that the, the individual is nothing compared to the collective because the collective is what allows us to move forward on this historical path. And I always try to use very simple explanations, so, so I'll, I'll give you this one. If, if you were to draw a timeline and chart out uh, human nature over time, the way the progressives saw it, it would be a straight line. Right? It's this belief that there are certain principles that don't change over time, that, that are actually constants. Right? And, and, and yet if you were to take Hegel's view, that timeline would suddenly be going up. Right? Human nature is something that at least ought to be going up. Right? There ought to be progress. Progress becomes the important thing and, and becomes, I think, a very apt word to capture this view when it jumps the pond and comes to uh, the United States. Progressivism, N not, not the idea that certain things, technologies, you know, iPhones uh, are finally going to be big enough that I can, that I can see them. Uh, but uh, it's not about that. It's about the fundamental things, right? That everything is negotiable. Everything, even human nature, even right and wrong, should be, can be, will be if, if the state has enough power if we are devoted to it enough, can be made to progress, right? And, uh, and, and, and that is the view. The German universities are the best, uh, considered to be the best in the late 19th century. A lot of Americans go there to study. And in the areas of the hard sciences, they really are producing incredible advance, uh, ad advances. Of course, the problem is uh, that when you, when you treat uh, uh, things like uh, your understanding of justice, like it's just another hard science, you sort of forget those insights of the ancient Romans, right, that some of these things, we are looking through a glass darkly. Some of these things are a little harder to understand, and we're always at the risk of deceiving ourselves, especially when our self-interest is involved. But Hegel's view tells people, tells particularly university students, uh, something very important. And I'll get out my, my line again, right? If if society is going like this, it provides us with a, an interesting answer to who should rule, right? And we can't say the rule of law because suddenly law has become this very fluid thing, right? But if humanity at any given time is a segment on this line, who should rule, right? It's whoever is at the top of that segment, whoever has made the most progress, whoever, whoever is the most advanced. And 
obviously. Again, this, this view is being taught to university students. That's very appealing, right? These are people who are told, you have the latest knowledge. You have the latest information. You are the best trained, the most advanced. Hegel said, <laughs> think about how self-serving this is. He said the latest philosophy is always the best. It's always the most important. You can always just ignore what came before and look at the latest philosophy because it, it, it must be, it's the latest, it must be the greatest, right? And, uh, I mean, this, this view has fascinating ramifications, right? If you've ever asked yourself, why did the, the way people look at history change so dramatically in the 20th century, right? From, from James Madison, who, you know, Madison is like one of the smartest people in North America, leading up to the Constitutional Convention. And he's writing to Thomas Jefferson, saying, you've got to send me more books <laughs> because I've got to learn more from, from human history, right? Because he believes those fundamental things haven't changed over time. And he can open Plutarch, and he can go back and read about the ancient Greek and Roman statesmen, and they were dealing with the same problems that the founders and the framers were dealing with, and the same problems we're dealing with today, ultimately, because that we've met the enemy and they are us, right? They come from our own human nature and that isn't changing at the most fundamental level, right? But the progressives look at history totally differently, right? They go back to history not to learn from it, but almost to teach it lessons, right? They take our own current perspective and they go back and they study history uh, to, to see what history did wrong because it makes their progressive case, right? If you can go back to history and hit it with a hammer, you start to create the perception that it really is on this, this amazing incline, right? If you go back and you convince people that, you know, the founders were a bunch of greedy, slave-owning smugglers, and that's all they were, all of a sudden your students say, well, wow, we're not like that, right? And it becomes a, a self-fulfilling prophecy for progressives in the academy. But it has a lot of other ramifications as well. You go to the early American progressives and they start using this word, bureaucracy. <laughs> and today we use it as an epithet. But they used it as, it was, it was this great vision of a new way to do government. Where instead of having everything decided by, uh, they wouldn't say the rabble, they were a little, little too politically correct to say that, but instead of you know, just putting everything out there to a vote, we're not going to do that, that's messy. We're going to take these new experts that we have created in the university and we are going to create almost like little universities within government, agencies with bureaucrats. And, and really, it is sort of jarring to go back and read in the 1890s and early 20th century. I mean, bureaucrat was, I mean, it was thought of as this is a wonderful thing, right? And uh, they, they, they didn't have the DMV uh, in, in the 1890s. Uh, but, uh, I mean, this, this is the view. We, what we need to do in government, see if you think this has happened <laughs> since, uh, since then, we need to move the power out of the democratic apparatuses. And we need to move it into the administrative agencies, right? Because we need to put it in the hands of experts. Again, they're the ones who are most progressed. They know what to do, right? And we were, we were talking at the break, actually, about uh, two of the problems that we face uh, with, with just getting people engaged. One is that the political discourse oftentimes just gets so nasty that it turns people off. But the other is that progressives tell people, if you're not an expert, don't worry about it. Right? The American founders did not say that. Go back and read uh, Alexis de Tocqueville writing about his observations in early 19th century America. He said, everybody's got an opinion. <laughs> you know, everybody's, and there's so many offices, everybody takes part in government. There are all these people running around who've served in the, these little petty elected offices, and they all think they have something to say and people should listen. <laughs> and uh, I mean, de, de Tocqueville is just, he's just blown away by all this. Um, he points out there, there are some reasons for concern, right? Back to human nature, have a lot of people involved in government, a lot, of, a lot of possible ways things can go wrong, especially if someone comes along and gives them a vision, right, that says you're not accountable to the law, right? You are accountable to uh, expertise, right, to, the, to, to progress itself. So this is the progressive vision, and, and it is a challenge to the American founding. It really is the, the first... Uh, the, the first real full-throated, I think, challenge uh, nationwide at least to the American founding and arguing to the American people that we should move beyond that. And Woodrow Wilson, before he was a politician, he was a political scientist. 
And so he actually wrote about ideas. So we actually, you know, there are a lot of people who've been involved in politics their whole lives, and uh, their whole mission is to not let you know what they really think. Uh, but we know what Woodrow Wilson really thought because he was involved in this debate. And, uh, and he was uh, not just an American progressive, but one of the leading thinkers, and then obviously the leading politician. Uh, he, was, he was president of Princeton University, and then he was uh, governor of New Jersey, and then he becomes president of the United States, in, uh, elected in 1912. And uh, on page 54 in the reading packet, we have an excerpt from, uh, from his uh, The New Freedom. All right, just reflect on that title, The New Freedom. Uh, just as he is uh, becoming president of the United States, on, on line 12, a great expl explanation of progressivism, we think of the future, not the past, as the, most, the more glorious time in comparison with which the present is nothing. It's a little dangerous glimmer of the ends justifying the means there, I think. Progress, development, those are modern words. The modern idea is to leave the past and press onward to something new. Something. He, he says actually a little earlier in this excerpt, he says that when he was president at Princeton, his job, as he saw it, was to make young men as unlike their fathers as possible. Right? I've heard that same complaint about universities today. You know, you, the parents pay all this money to have their kids told you know, how their parents are, uh, are you know, knuckle-dragging uh, troglodytes or something. Um, <clears throat> skipping down to, uh, to line 82, uh, he's been complaining uh, in the intervening lines about uh, the Federalist and the Declaration and the, the way the founders saw things. And talking about their theory, he says, the trouble with their theory is that government is not a machine but a living thing. It falls not under the theory of the universe, but under the theory of organic life. It is accountable to Darwin, not to Newton. Skipping down a little bit, no living thing can have its organs offset against each other as checks and live. On the contrary, its life is dependent upon their quick cooperation, their ready response to the commands of instinct or intelligence, their amicable community of purpose. A, a, a very clear argument, he's not really trying to hide the ball here, I don't think, against checks and balances, separation of powers, right? The, the new progressive administrative agencies will eventually have their own rulemaking authority. Looks a lot like legislative branch. Obviously, they're, they're part of the executive branch. They, they, they carry out uh, their own uh, enforcement. Uh, actually, now most of them have SWAT teams. The EPA has a SWAT team for its own enforcement. And then they have their own courts, right? Uh, Wilson's vision achieved there. All of the separation of powers broken down and all these things pushed together in, in their own agencies, exactly what uh, many of the founders said. They said, uh, if, you, if you combine all the three powers into one set of hands, it is the very definition of tyranny. Right? But Wilson says it's the only way to accomplish progressive government, to allow government to grow and, uh, and to expand. Um, he goes on to say there, uh, to complain, some citizens of this country, maybe he's talking about you, have never got beyond the Declaration of Independence, uh, is uh, the last line I'll give you from Wilson. But Wilson, Wilson is not as successful as he appears. Wilson wins because Taft and Roosevelt split the Republican ticket, uh, split the Republican vote in 1912. Now, Roosevelt was, was very influenced by the progressives, at least. Um, but, uh, but Wilson, the, the full-throated, honest progressive challenging the Constitution, wins on a fluke. And then he wins re-election, a lot of people think, because uh, the coming of World War I had people concerned, don't change horses in midstream. A lot of the progressives looked at Wilson and said, uh, you know, that, that was great, but, but after Wilson, they lose. And, and they don't just lose, they get demolished in the 1920s. <laughs> Up until Tuesday, Republicans did not have as much control at the state legislative level uh, since the 1920s. Um, right? So uh, the, the 1920s are the heyday, and, and it's not just Republicans. Calvin Coolidge winds up as president. Calvin Coolidge is, uh, and I will, I will close with a quote from Coolidge. I'm not going to give it to you yet. Um, it's just too good not to close with. Coolidge gets the progressives. He understands exactly what they're about, and he stands up, and he makes the argument for why they're wrong. 
Not why we should go slower, not why we should just do it a little different. He says they are wrong and they're dangerously wrong. And, and, and so the progressives actually think, uh, they, they think that they may be politically done. But, and here's the important point for anybody involved in politics and political change, the progressives are still winning, even in the 1920s, many of their cultural and educational battles. Right? I told you about the university. Progressives, I mean, they don't just come into the American university. Frankly, it was all American colleges. They refound them as universities on the German model. They found new universities on the German model. Right? You go back and, and you look at, uh, from roughly 1890 to 1920, uh, look at uh, the universities that are out there, and you will see that many of them were colleges before that, or they were created in that era. And they were created by people who had studied the German model and wanted it here. And again, in, in the hard sciences, some of this produced advancements, but uh, they also convinced people that they could treat everything else as, as if it was just another hard science, um, even politics, even government, um, even, even, uh, uh, even justice. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the progressives are winning their cultural battles, and ultimately, Politics follows culture. Politics is a lagging indicator behind culture, right? The progressives' victory, I submit to you, was made inevitable because they won not just in education, they won in the major, the major religious denominations. Uh, they, were, they were winning in, uh, uh, in, in social organizations, they were winning at the local level. Um, eventually their victory in politics was assured because they were winning their cultural and educational battles. That's part of why we're here tonight, right? Um, ultimately, campaigns, uh, politics, everything that's gone on for the last few months matters a lot, right? But ultimately, if that is not coupled with engagement at the cultural and educational level, you will be, you will lose, right? Um, you, you're just spitting in the wind, and, and eventually you will lose to culture um, and, and to, to what people are, are taught to believe. Uh, but the, the progressives... Uh, when they come back, of course, they're aided by the Great Depression, and they're also aided by a much savvier politician than Woodrow Wilson, and that is Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt recognizes, and this is still true today, and this is part of our advantage today, Roosevelt recognizes, look, you don't have to go out and tell Americans that the American founders were wrong. <laughs> that, is, that is still not a great way to win in American politics. The polls show that Americans like the founders, they like the Constitution, People who don't know what's in the Constitution like the Constitution, right? Which is advantage us if we want to revive constitutional government. Uh, <clears throat> we just have to show people why it matters uh, enough that they'll want to understand it and then actually enforce it on their government. But FDR takes a different tack. FDR says, let's just re-explain the American founding. Let's just say it means something different. And if you flip over to page 56, we get to see his greatest, his greatest attempt, very successful attempt, at re-explaining what the Declaration of Independence means at its core. This is from a speech he delivered in 1932 on the, the, the uh, campaign trail for his first re-election at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco. And he says, the Declaration of Independence discusses the problem of government in terms of a contract. Con uh, government is a relation of give and take, a contract perforce if we would follow the thinking out of which it grew. Under such a contract, rulers were accorded power and the people consented to that power on consideration that they be accorded certain rights. The task of statesmanship has always been the redefinition of these rights in terms of a changing and growing social order. Now, the beginning of that, okay, social compact, social contract, right, the declaration, people coming together, that doesn't seem uh, problematic, right? But, but wait a second, he says that the, it's a contract between, not, not among the people to create a government, but a contract between the people and government, which implies that somehow government pre-exists or exists alongside the people, somehow it is not the people ruling themselves, but there is a governing class in that equation, right? But, but even, even setting that concern aside, what does he say the whole task is? Government 
goes to the people and says, if you give us power, we will give you rights. And the whole task of statesmanship is convincing the people to give government more power in exchange for government creating more rights for the people. And unless you think that, you know, he's just uh, uh, carried away, uh, you, can, you can go through the rest of this on your own time. The rest of the excerpt I've given you, he goes through basic rights, like property rights. And he explains why government is going to create a new property right. And then, and then he says, when government creates that new property right, what happens? All other property rights must yield. And he goes through, you can just, you see this, it's, it's his format for uh, the next section of the speech, is to say, here's a right that's really important, property or the right to life or, or, or what have you. Here's how government is going to give you something that sounds like that right. And if you want that thing, then you have to agree that your other rights um, are, are viable after all, right? Your other rights, all, all of them must yield, as he says, with property rights. Right. This is a totally alien vision of government to the founders, to Jefferson, to the Declaration. It's not at all what the Declaration says. But Jefferson, Jefferson just, uh, excuse me, uh, Roosevelt just passes it off that way. He doesn't say, this is what I think. He says, this is what Jefferson meant. This is what the Declaration means. Let's just view it in this light. You want something? You need something? Something in your life makes you unhappy? Well, you let me know, and I, as a statesman, will figure out how to package that up as a new right, and as long as you give me enough power, I can give you that thing, right? That is one view of government. It's certainly not the founder's view no, no, no. of government. And, uh, and, and yet FDR is, is very successful with this. And of course, uh, again, kind of like Wilson, part of, it is, uh, part of it is that you have this crisis in the Depression. You have an obvious crisis in World War II. And, uh, and it gives him cover. And part of it is that he's a very effective politician. Right, but it's a complete reimagining um, along progressive lines of what the founders meant when they created government. And, uh, and it takes us right back to, uh, to what Wilson said in, in another place, which is all the progressives ask or desire is to interpret the Constitution according to the Darwinian principle, uh, which again, echoing what we read from Wilson, just make the Constitution flexible. Don't treat it as rules, treat it as guidelines or suggestions and allow government to grow. And uh, again, in, in, in the next two programs, when we talk about federalism, when we talk about separation of powers, we will look at how they did that um, and why they did that. And we'll look at maybe how we can undo much of that to get back to the actual constitutional structure based on the actual constitutional principles. So I, I told you, I would wrap up with, uh, uh, with, with Calvin Coolidge, and then we'll answer some, some questions. And, uh, and I do hope you'll join us for the next programs, because again, this is, this is about walking up to the Constitution and the principles that underlie it. Um, and, then, uh, and then we will get into the document itself in the next two programs, and then come around to the idea of rights and, uh, and what all that means in the Constitution. One, one, uh, one analogy I should, I should give you here, uh, people have asked, well, how does the Declaration really relate to the Constitution? I mean, isn't the Constitution, that's the law, and uh, I think all but one of the justices on the Supreme Court um, basically hold that view. You know, that the principles are one thing, but it's just the law. We just look at the law on its own terms. There's, there's one justice, does anybody know who it is, who actually thinks that you have to understand the Declaration of Independence and those principles to understand the Constitution? What's that? No, not Scalia. Thomas. Who said Thomas? I don't think I have any more books. You got me. I'll give you one to, to give to someone else. Because um, that's a good... No, no actually, and, it, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a tragedy because um, Scalia, I think, has the background that he should understand this, but, um, but, he, but he doesn't. At least he doesn't hold this view. Uh, and, I mean, he's a great textualist. But, but Thomas really agrees with Lincoln. Here, here's, the, here's the way Lincoln explained this relationship. And I, I, think, this is, uh, I think this is very useful. Uh, there's a verse in the book of Proverbs that says, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. And uh, 
Alexander Stevens actually had used this verse in a letter to Lincoln to say that if you would just concede the moral point on slavery, just say that you think slavery is okay, that would be like a word fitly spoken, like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Obviously, Lincoln does not do that. He does not agree with that. And he flips it around, writes it on a scrap of paper, puts it in his hat, like Reagan would write ideas on note cards for speeches. Lincoln would write ideas on scraps of paper. This one was found after he was killed. And, and he said, he said, no, the, the, the principles of the Declaration are like those apples of gold. And the Constitution is that setting, that frame of silver around them. And it always takes me back to the, the great 19th century paintings I've seen. Right, from Lincoln's era, they would, they would have some grand painting. They would make the frame for that painting, uh, carved in plaster or carved in wood, oftentimes covered in gold, and very specific, in many cases, to that painting. The frame is a work of art, custom made. It's a beautiful thing. But if you tear that picture out of the frame, it loses its purpose. It loses its meaning. Right, what Lincoln is saying with this, with this metaphor is that the relationship of the Constitution to the Declaration is like that. If you take those principles away, ultimately that frame, either someone will come along and try to paste inside that frame some other principles that won't really ultimately match up, or the frame will be taken down because it, it has lost its meaning and put away. People won't understand it, no matter how beautiful it is. Right? We call the people who wrote, who designed the Constitution, framers, right? And, and I, I think that's very true. They designed a structure. The Constitution is a structure, right? But its meaning, its meaning comes from the, the purpose, right? From the principles, from the ideas that are so well put, I think, in the Declaration of Independence. Here is, here is what Calvin Coolidge said. Uh, July 5th, uh, 1926, the 4th was a Sunday, and, and so that was the Lord's Day, so they held their big celebration on Monday, July 5th, the 150th uh, anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. And, uh, and Coolidge gives this, this uh, amazing speech. Uh, and uh, here is a part of what he says, and I will conclude with this, and then we can take some, some questions. Coolidge says, about the Declaration, there is a finality that is exceedingly restful. It is often asserted that the world has made a great deal of progress since 1776, that we have had new thoughts and new experiences which have given us a great advance over the people of that day, and that we may, therefore, very well discard their conclusions for something more modern. But that reasoning cannot be applied to this great charter. If all men are created equal, that is final. If they are endowed with inalienable rights, that is final. If governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed, that is final. No advance, no progress can be made beyond these propositions. If anyone wishes to deny their truth or their soundness, the only direction in which he can proceed historically is not forward, but backward, toward the time when there was no equality, no rights of the individual, no rule of the people. Those who wish to proceed in that direction cannot lay claim to progress. They are reactionary. Their ideas are not more modern but more ancient than those of the Revolutionary Fathers. Uh, this is Calvin Coolidge's summation of the progressives in their conflict with the Declaration. So with that, uh, I'm very thankful that all of you came here tonight and, uh, and participated in this, uh, this special final presentation of this uh, uh, this first in our four-part series on the Constitution. I hope you'll join us again, and I am happy to, uh, to take any of your questions. <laughs>